One of the most famous stories from Chernobyl is that of Perevozchenko. In the seconds before the accident, it is famously told that he looked down upon the reactor hall and saw the caps of the fuel channels and control rods bouncing up and down. Specifically, to quote Grigory Medvedev's The Truth About Chernobyl, which was first published in 1989, Valery Ivanovich Perevozchenko entered the reactor hall at level plus 50 on the balcony near the fresh fuel transfer station on his rounds. He then looked down at the floor of the central hall and towards the reactor lid. Suddenly, Perevozchenko shuddered. Strong and frequent shocks began, and the 770 pound cubes started to jump up and down on top of the channels as if 1,700 people were tossing their hats in the air. His hands torn by friction and colliding painfully with the corners of the handrail, Perovozchenko rushed madly down the steep, almost vertical spiral steps to level plus 10, into the corridor connecting the main circulation pump compartments. He ran on legs, weak with tremor to the left, to the door heading to the DA rater, where beyond a safety lock lay the 328 foot corridor, in the middle of which was the entrance to the number 4 control room. Perovozchenko makes quite the ride. According to Medvedev, this occurs at 012340. Given that historically, the first explosion was a major steam discharge at 012344, per Chernobyl Accident Revisited and Revenge of the Peaceful Atom, that momentarily lifted Elena, this gives Perovozchenko four seconds to escape the reactor hall before he would have been vaporized in the explosion. Obviously, this story is not true. In Pierre Paul Reed's Ablaze, the story of Chernobyl, which includes interviews with Yevchenko and Dyatlov, Perevozchenko was called to the control room by Dyatlov around 1.20 a.m. and arrived just before the explosion. This is corroborated again in Dyatlov's book, How It Was, and Agilov's interview in 2021. There is no physical way Perevozchenko could have been in the reactor hall before the explosion. And yet, it appears in many well-researched documentations. HBO's Chernobyl miniseries, Higginbotham's Midnight in Chernobyl, Leverbarrow's Chernobyl 12340, Kotsenko's Chernobyl Prelude of a Disaster, Ian Fitzgerald's Chernobyl, reads ablaze the story of Chernobyl, despite literally including Perevozchenko being called to the control room, and the TV film Chernobyl The Final Warning, among countless other cases that have copied from these sources and others, so much so that it has been on Wikipedia for a long period of time. It has since been removed. But let us humour this story, and actually calculate how fast Perovozchenko's route through the reactor hall and to the control room must have been to have not been vaporised in the explosion. The first thing to establish is, where is Perovozchenko? Because he can't be on plus 50. True, there were two beams of concrete running down both sides of plus 50.8, but these were the beams that the refueling machine rested on as it moved down the reactor hall. At plus 49.9, there is a balcony that was on the west side of the reactor hall that overlooked the upper biological shield, and it sounds like the perfect place for Perovozchenko to be. He would run down the staircase there and out of the reactor hall, before crossing over to a staircase on the western side of the reactor building and descending from plus 35.5 to plus 10. Perfect, right? No, it's not. Returning to Medvedev, in a statement previously omitted from the first extract as it did not matter to the story, he looked at the loading machine, which was standing still near the far wall, and then at the door in the wall behind Kyrgyz and Gemrik, the central hall operators, were in a small compartment. Perovozchenko could not have been able to see this door, as it would have been directly below him. Perovozchenko must be even higher. The most likely catwalk that Medvedev is referring to is on plus 58.5, near the top of the hall. Following through, we can assume Perovozchenko's route out to control room 4. Perovozchenko starts above the reactor hall, at plus 58.5. He then runs across the staircase on the eastern side of the reactor hall, and descends the stairwell to plus 35.5, back across the reactor hall, then out through the main entrance. He then crosses over to the stairwell on the westernmost side and descends to plus 10, before entering the control room. We have floor plans for both Unit 3 and Unit 4 before the accident. Calculating Perovozchenko's position and the distance they would have to travel down the route, they would have moved 54 meters to the stairwell on plus 58.5. 
48 meters descending down the stairs to the ground floor of the reactor hall. 50 meters from the ground floor of the reactor hall across to the exit. 48 meters from the exit of the reactor hall to the stairwell. 36 meters descending the stairs from plus 35.5 to plus 10. 36 meters from the stairs to the control room. This means that Perifrostchenko travels 272 meters in 8 seconds, the time between seeing the rod caps bounce and arrival in the control room just after the explosion, or approximately 34 meters per second. This is equal to 76.5 miles an hour or 122.4 kilometers per hour in order to arrive there in time. Perifrostchenko completely smashes Usain Bolt's top speed of 27 miles per hour by almost 3 times. But we are not done there. This is where things get from quite funny to totally ridiculous. The first explosion occurred just four seconds after Perovoschenko is supposed to have seen the caps bouncing. This completely filled the reactor hall all the way up to the stairwell with steam. This means that Perovoschenko travelled the first 200 meters in just four seconds, or 50 meters per second. This is 112.5 miles per hour. 112.5 or 180 kilometers per hour. Sound travels at 770 miles per hour. This means that Perovoschenko can travel at about 15% the speed of sound if you accept Perovoschenko's run to be true. None of this factors in that he would have to slow down at turns, descending the stairs, or opening the door to the reactor hall. Perovoschenko should have been in the Olympics. At this point, we must ask why so many authors consider Perovoschenko's run to be a factual event, when all evidence proves it to be a total fabrication. Perhaps we may have come to consider how much we take these stories for granted. Medvedev's book is considered a totally accurate recreation by so many, when there are books that do much of a better job. But we still need to learn to take everything with a grain of salt. I consider Perovoschenko's run to be a good line on the extent of an author's knowledge on Chernobyl. The more you learn about the people, the history, and the place, the more you realise it is completely impossible. Learning about everyone's actions and how it all comes together is key to understanding Chernobyl. The people guides everything, and the building guides the people.